Hey, welcome everybody. I'm Chris Woolley and I'm your host for Let's Develop. And this is a fun webinar series. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. So what we do here is we've got an hour long webinar where we meet with some of the top photographers across the nation and we just share information, just elevating our industry, uh, sharing new ideas, new techniques, fun ways of doing things. And you're here, you're part of it. So I wanna thank you for joining us. So this is a webinar format. So a couple of important things that we're gonna to wanna to do, we can ask questions here and we've got Esteban and he is gonna be answering those questions for us as well as sharing information. So if you do have questions during anything that's going on, put them into chat and I'm gonna flag those as a question and at the very end, we're gonna go through and answer some of those questions. So uh, if you do have them, make sure that we are putting them there do also have some prizes and giveaways uh, at the very end of the program. So make sure you're staying to the end uh, for your chance to win some cool prizes and learn about a special that American Color Imaging has going on. Speaking of which, want to give a shout out to ACI for helping make this possible because uh, we're going to have fun today. Um, we do have this webinar that comes out every two weeks. Um, so if you want to uh, see the upcoming lineup or watch any of the past webinars, you can do that on ACI's website, acilab.com slash let's-develop, which is where you registered for this webinar at. If you missed the last one, uh, that was Justin Tedford doing passion projects. Um, so that one is live on the website, so you can check that out. But let's dive in. That's what we're here for, to learn from Esteban. Uh, so uh, he is crazy, crazy talented. He's based out of Connecticut. He's a wedding photographer and educator and super cool guy all around. Uh, I had the uh, pleasure of meeting him when I was uh, uh, up in Maine. And uh, we kind of hit off and just had a, a blast. And he's just a really, really nice guy. So I was like, all right, we got to connect. We got to do more stuff. Uh, so he's uh, definitely one of those guys that just makes learning fun. He shares his passion with you, uh, which is just super, super cool. Uh, he does run an educational community, uh, Steel and Flint. Um, he goes through, they've got uh, education, group discussions, artistic challenges, and just generally helps other people grow. Uh, so if you want to up your photography game, be sure to check that out. I will send in a follow-up email right after this webinar uh, more information about how you can connect with him, as well as links to his websites and Facebook groups so that uh, we can be there. So, Esteban, welcome. Thank you. That was the best <laughs> intro ever. You called me cool, which no one ever does, and fun, <laughs> which no one definitely ever does. So, I mean, you're already my favorite person in the world because this is a first for me. I don't even know how to react to somebody calling me cool because anybody that knows me personally knows that at, that is the absolute farthest thing from the truth. So, Did you but I'll, I'll try hot? to be as cool. Is that what we're getting at in here? Yeah, like I'm like no, a super mom. No, I'm not cool. I'm just hot. No, no. <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely not true either. I, I, far from that too. So I'm the least cool person ever. But I, I try to portray myself as a, at least a, a little bit knowledgeable in certain things. So, so at least that works out really well. But, but I appreciate the info. I, I. I Again, thank you for that intro. That was that was very nice. So I'm, I'm excited to be here. So well, let's dive in. We're looking at uh, doing a one light cinematic wedding photography. So uh, you got some information to share for us? Yes. Yeah, we can get started. We have a lot of information. So again, I'm excited to 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 be here with you. I appreciate uh, your sponsors and you being able to to have me here. I'm excited to to share all this information with you uh, with you all that are on the webinar. Um, and if anybody has any questions, obviously ask away, and we could we could answer them at the end of the webinar. Um, I'd love to to get some feedback on people. If anybody's got any experience on on off camera flash, or um, or if they're beginners, um, just so I can have an idea of 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 what the uh, the level of skill is. And yeah, I know that during my workshop, flash, put it in the chat. Let us know yeah, what we're working yeah, let with us here. Know what, yeah. Yeah, let us know, and then we'll. And if anybody ever has any questions about anything, I'm always available. If we have Steel and Flint Society, which is a, a very positive group, I make sure that we run it in a way that's positive, that's uplifting. Um, if anybody has any questions about anything, it doesn't have to be off camera flash. It could be about wedding photography. It could be about uh, we have off topic Sundays. So if anybody has any questions about family photography or any any sort of questions, uh, feel free to post in there. And and it's just such an uplifting community, and I make sure that it's run that way in a way that's. Yeah, we're all helping each other out and lifting each other up. So feel free to join. 
So it looks like uh, we've got uh, people starting to come in saying uh, mostly new to intermediate uh, with off-camera flash, looking cool. to learn or get better at it. A couple of people haven't awesome. used it before. That's amazing. And I think one of the things that you'll be surprised from the presentation and from the way that I teach is that I base most of my stuff based on a very set of basic rules that I use for off-camera flash. Um, and then I just kind of bring that to, uh, throughout my entire wedding day. So you'll see that. That some of the rules that I use are very, very easy to follow. Um, I like to make sure that off-camera flash is something that's accessible and something that's not going to be overwhelming. Um, a lot of the time when somebody is a beginner, they try to jump all in and are using five, six different lights. And to me, simplicity is definitely the way to go. I think that when you use one flash and you kind of try to limit yourself a little bit with just the one light and try to be as creative... Um, that's when you really start to propel in a way that you start to create different things with the limitations of only having one flash. So, and that's what I love about the, the whole cinematic looks, but we'll talk about that. We'll get into that. afterwards. All right. Well, let's jump on in when you're ready. Cool. Awesome. So, um, again, just a quick intro. My name is Esteban Gill and I'm a natural life photographer. I love to start my webinars and any sort of workshops with this because I think it's important to, to, to understand that that off-camera flash photography doesn't have to overtake and it doesn't have to be the, the only thing that you're doing throughout your weddings. Um, as a wedding photographer, a lot of people look at my work and they have the misconception that I am just off-camera flash. So I'm using off-camera flash throughout the entire day. When in reality, 90% of my days, probably even 95% of my days are all natural light. Nothing will be natural light, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but I am a, very much a natural light photographer that's using off-camera flash when I absolutely need it, if I'm in a situation that there's a lack of light, um, or when I want to be creative. If I go into a room and the natural light that's available to me isn't isn't going to allow me to to create what I'm envisioning, that's when I bring in the light, and I can kind of shape the light, and I can do things differently where where I'm able to create what I'm envisioning as opposed to just kind of working with just the natural light. So two things, when I absolutely need it and when I want to be creative with it. So, um, and there's obviously when there's a, a lack of natural light. So um, my Instagram is eaglephoto and I, we just talked about Steel Fun Society. So if you want to follow us on Instagram, it's Steel Fun Society on Instagram. Um, and yeah, we, we post a bunch of our, our members uh, photos and then obviously the eagle photo is just more of my wedding stuff. If you're interested in seeing what that looks like. So I think everybody enjoys stopping cool. you. <laughs> well, um, yeah, most people at least. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get right to it. Let me hold your hand so tight and show you how much I never leave you. Let me hold your hand so tight and show you how much I never leave you. Yeah, so I like to open that up because I, I want to be able to show a, a good balance of off-camera flash and natural light. So again, my theme here is that you can be very much a natural light photographer and still be able to incorporate uh, off-camera flash into your work. Um, and to me, natural light is not going to be beat. There's nothing more important than natural light. The ability to walk into a room and being able to read natural light, harsh light, um, for example, if you look at something like this at the top here, you just have this very beautiful natural flat lighting, which you can work with. Um, and then just being able to shape natural light is also something that I like to do. So direct harsh light is something that I absolutely love. Uh, when I walk into a room and I see shadows and I see contrast, that's really what drives me a little bit crazy. And I walk into a room and I'm like, oh man, like now I can actually play around. Um, so again, don't go into this thinking that you're going to learn off camera flash and 
this is all you're going to use because that's just not the case. Um, I think that off camera flash to me just gives you the ability to have something called the range. So when I'm in a wedding, um, I don't necessarily go in thinking that I'm going to use natural light off uh, the entire day, or I don't think that I'm going to use off camera flash all day. Um, it just gives me the ability to have the skill set to use both both uh, uh, sides of, of, of photography. So I have my natural light images. So for example, um, when I talk about range, I, uh, for example, you have like the darker and moodier images in there. This is all the same wedding here, but but you have very different aspects of photography, or at least a stylistic uh, approach to photography. So, so you have your light and airy images, you have your dark and moody images. So natural light allows me to be able to create something different throughout the day. So um, even if I have a, uh, flat lighting in in, in a, a wedding or or in a wedding venue, um, I'm still able to create those dark and moody images with off camera flash, and that is done through um, through something that we'll we'll touch on a little bit later, which is more like high speed sync and being able to shoot in that in that cinematic uh, uh, style. So, uh, but before we do that, I'm just going to talk to you about a, a couple of different uh, products that I absolutely love. Um, for example, I have Geekodo which is uh, my main light. That's a Geekodo GT200. Um, and to me, Geekodo is is comparable to like a, a Godax, but to me, it just works a little bit more consistently as far as like light color and overheating. It doesn't overheat as much. It's a little more durable. Um, and they're just a great company. It's just an amazing company. There's And the people behind it are just so cool. So I've, I, I love using their products. Uh, and I mostly use the GT200 or the NLX280, which I'll get into uh, a little bit later. So. Um, again, as far as modifiers, um, I'm being a Magmod ambassador. I, I do love and use, uh, all my Magmod stuff. So, uh, my main light is my main modifier is going to be the Magbox, uh, 24 inch, uh, Octobox. Uh, that to me is a great size because I don't like to be too constricted with, with the sizing of the softbox. So I like to create nice soft light. Um, but I also don't want to carry around a 60, 70 inch soft box. I feel like that's something that that can get a little bit clunky during weddings. Uh, so I tried to stick to the 24 inch Octa and then some of their newer products, like the 36 inch, uh, strip that to me is one of the coolest, um, uh, uh, additions that they've put in their lineup, uh, just because it just creates a little bit of a different look and it gives you a little bit more versatility when it comes to creating that darker and moodier and cinematic look to the images. Um, and then if you want, if you're okay carrying around a, a, a larger softbox and you have the 42 inch octobox, I have it. I generally will only use it for like headshots or anything like that. But during weddings, I'm mostly sticking to the 24 inch octobox and the 36 inch strip. So, um, one thing that if you have followed my work or any of my educational, uh, material, I always have an assistant with me. Uh, having an assistant is probably one of the most important things that you can do to alleviate a lot of the headaches that come from off-camera flash, uh, setting up lights and tripods and people tripping over them. Uh, to me, that's something that I really wanted to get rid of at the beginning of my career. Um, I, I hated putting tripods in corners of dance floors. Uh, you have kids running around. It's a liability. So to me, being able to hire an assistant to have them hold my softbox and being able to not only just have more of a safe work area, but being able to direct them to what I want them to do is one of the most important aspects of, of what I do. So um, I, I can easily tell my assistant to go to a certain spot in the dance floor or to go to a certain spot wherever I'm taking an image, um, but I can't tell a light stand to do that. So a light stand is gonna take me away from the interactions that I'm having with my couples. So if I'm photographing a couple, I have to stop what I'm doing to move a light stand. If I have an assistant, I can actually vocalize what I want them to do. So um, there's always that stigma of like, well, an assistant's going to cost me an arm and a leg. Um, there's so many ways that you can you can have an assistant. Obviously, I have an assistant that, that has worked with me for a very long time. Um, and they just they just know how I work. Um, but at, at, at the beginning, I mean, you could easily go to a college, you could go to a, a high school, pay them a you still want to pay your people that are working for you. Um, but just a combination of a, a pay with with a combination of, of the experience of them learning 
how you shoot. Um, so going to schools and like hiring these people are, is always a good idea. So, but to, for my assistant, I always use an impact quick stick plus, which it's just an amazing little monopod that, that they just hold with, with my strobe and my softbox. Um, and it just works out really well. Um, it's pretty, pretty affordable too. I think it's like, it's usually on sale for like $35. So I have a bunch of them sitting at home. So, uh, as far as lights that I use, um, I use a Godox V860 Mark II or three or a V1 or a Gigoto GTR. That's just a, um, speed light. Those are ones that you're just going to use when you don't really require a lot of flash power. Um, if you wanted to do anything that was a little bit more powerful, I use the Gikoto NLX280. Uh, the NLX280 is more rated at like the 300 watt second. So that's more when I'm outside and I need to kind of overpower the sun a little bit more. Um, this image was taken with that. And it's just an amazing light uh, as far as color consistency and as far as, as just the overheating that I've seen from a lot of the other brands, uh, this kind of gets rid of that and it's just been an absolute joy to use so far um i've used it for probably about six months and it's just it's never really given me any issues at all so uh then you have a gikoto gt200 which i talked about a little bit earlier and, and 250 um those lights are just also amazing so the the one of the advantages of the gikoto products is that you you can actually uh, combine them with your godax stuff so you can control your gikoto products with your Godox uh, trigger. So if you're thinking of switching over, you can always use your, your, um, your triggers and, and to, to trigger your, your Gikoto products. So, uh, Gikoto lightsaber, not lightsaber, it's an LS 100, but it's, we, I call it a lightsaber. It's just a, an led light and it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, I never thought that I would use, I actually always used to talk a lot of junk about led lights and continuous light because I'm very much an off camera flash user. Uh, but once, once Gikoto introduced me to this LS100, I was just like, whoa, I can do some really cool stuff with continuous light because um, you can actually see where the light's falling. You can change the power based on like what it looks like. So continuous light is definitely a great way to get started into using off-camera flash because you're actually able to see live where your light is hitting. Um, so as far as practicing with light, then I would definitely recommend practicing with with a uh, continuous light at first so you can see uh, what the actual images are going to look like right before your eyes instead of just trying to figure out powers and, and going up and down in power. So, uh, Geekoto GT400 is one that I use. It's the most powerful one that they have. It's a 400 watt second image, uh, it's 400 watt second light. And, and that one's just mostly used just to overpower the sun. So when I'm really struggling in a midday sun, um, that's when I'll bring that out and, and it just works wonders. Um, I've never really felt the need to, to, to use anything over that 400 watt seconds. Um, but, but this slide is just pretty, pretty amazing. So, uh, as far as lenses is what I use in my bag, I use a Canon 17 to 40. I actually just upgraded this to the 15 to 35 F 2.8 RF. Um, and I always like to use uh, an ultra wide angle lens just because I, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm really focusing a lot on composition, um, being able to tell a story rather than just zooming in at 85 and at 105. Um, to me, one of the most important aspects of what we do is really being able to tell a story through composition. Uh, and this, these lenses allow me to do that. So I'm, I would generally get a good amount of images, images um, at that ultra wide angle range. So uh, this was also taken with the 17 to 40, again, just showing off, and making sure that that I'm displaying and I'm telling everyone where we were and what the venue looked like. Um, and I'll kind of do a, a, a deep dive of this image in a little bit. So uh, this was also taken with the 17 to 40. Again, just having an ultra wide, I think is, is super important, especially when you're using off camera flash. Uh, this one was also taken with the 17 to 40. These getting up on the, on the, um, the second floor of the churches are some, one of the things I absolutely love doing too. So. Um, if you have a strong second shooter, always try to get that that nice second angle or that that angle that most people wouldn't really think of, and and usually that angle is is going up there and getting that wide shot of of the bride walking down the aisle. So, uh, thirty five millimeter at one point eight RF is what I'll generally use for my my uh, detail shots and for some of the portraits. I'm not a huge thirty five shooter, which is surprising. Most people use a thirty five eighty five combo. I'm more of a 5085 combo. I'm very much a 50 millimeter shooter, um, but sometimes I'll I'll bring out the 35 just just in case I need a little bit more of a wide range. Uh, this is also with the 35 
35.1.8 here again just to kind of show a little bit more of of the whether it's the venue or um or wherever you're shooting i think 35 is a really great focal length um i'm showing a little bit of uh off camera flash and some of these techniques i'll i'll talk about in a little bit so silhouetting is super important with with uh with off camera flash and it allows you to to create some really cool dynamic images so uh, this is with the 35 1.8 as well uh, my all-time favorite lens is a 45 millimeter tilt shift it's something that everyone always makes fun of me for it's like oh yeah i used to use that in 2015 and i'm like yeah i mean it was cool back then but it's still cool now um i absolutely love using it i think it gives a really great perspective um and clients love it which at the end of the day if you're a photographer and you make fun of me for using a 45 millimeter tilt shift i don't care because my clients absolutely love the images. So, um, yeah, 45 is just absolutely unbelievable lens. I think I paid like 400 bucks for it used and never in a million years would, would I have thought that I would use it as much as I do now. It just gives a really, really cool look. So, uh, this is another one that I did with 45 millimeter tilt shift. Um, and then, yeah, it just gives a cool perspective, especially with when it comes to like bridal parties and you have some good symmetry in the background. Canon 50 RF 1.2. Again, everyone knows and loves the 50 RF 1.2. Um, and it's just one of the best lenses that Canon has come out for the RF system. So uh, got some over here, we got some GIF stuff going on. If anybody's interested in learning how to use a GIF, how to do a GIF, we also have that on our website. But this is an off-camera flash uh, talk, so I'm not going to go into GIFs. So, but if you do, go into steelofunsociety.com and you can check out how you do it on there. So. 85 1.2 RF is another one that I absolutely love using. Uh, if I want to get into off-camera flash with details, the LAO 100 is one that I would generally use. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. You can really get up close, um, and it just it just does a really good job at getting those ultra macro images, um, especially with something like this. Like for example, I have the um, I'm getting a macro shot of the the bride's eyes, and I put the bride's parents in front of a window to to kind of give a little bit more meaning to the image. So I always like doing this shot, especially when I have the opportunity and the time to do it. So, all right, so that's the equipment that I use. Now I am going to talk about some of the off-camera flash and techniques that put money, money in my pocket. Um, we do have uh, just a, a note for the people that are typing in questions. I know we've got a few of those coming up here. Um, at the very end, we'll be uh, answering those. So he's not ignoring you, I promise. Yes, yes, I am not ignoring you, no. <laughs> I only ignore my kids when they're driving me nuts, but everybody else I don't ignore. Um, so OCF technique. So I'm going to talk about some of the most basic things that you can do with OCF to really create that cinematic look. Um, to me, one of the most important things is to shoot in manual. Uh, shooting in manual is super important because you have full control of your flash. You don't want to shoot in TTL. TTL is through the lens metering, meaning that you're sort of telling, you're, you're trusting the flash and the, the metering system of the camera to expose um, and determine what power your flash is going to be at. Um, so I would just go into shoot, shooting in manual. If you go in manual, you just have full control of the flash and you don't have to worry about the camera overexposing or underexposing your images because that meter incorrectly. So definitely shoot in manual. One of the most important things that I do and I like to teach is that you want to be at 132nd power. One of the reasons why I do that is because 132nd is sort of the middle range of the power of the flash. So if I'm at 132nd and I feel like my image is underexposed, then I am going to move into a higher power. Um, if I start up in the middle of the power range, it makes it easier for me to move up or down. Uh, so you definitely want to start off at 132nd when it comes to that. There's a few exceptions, especially when it comes to um, to details, uh, which I'll, I'll touch on a little bit. So again, something that a lot of people seem to get wrong when it comes to off-camera flash is the closer that your light source is to your subject, the softer the light is going to be. So I like to create a really soft look around my subject. And in order to do that, that requires me to be really close to my subject. Um, and that's where a, a little bit of Photoshopping comes in because my assistant might be super close to my subject that might, might be getting one of those really ultra wide angle images. So I'll touch on that in a little bit and how I get my assistant out. 
I'm not doing any crazy photoshopping or anything. I'm just basically just doing a quick, quick photoshopping job and, and I'm done with it. So, um, as far as distance, I'm about three to five feet and above eye level. You don't want to shoot from below your subject because what happens is you're going to create shadows that are not going to be very pleasing to the eye. Um, so you want to be about three to five feet away and up, up high. So anywhere above eye level should be good. The best starting point as far as to creating a cinematic look is about 45 degrees. Uh, so you want to create a 45 degree angle. If I'm, if my subject is in front of me, I want to have my assistant or my light stand create a 45 degree angle. So the closer you get to the 90 degree angle, the more dramatic the images are going to look. So just keep that in mind. If you get closer to 90 degrees, it's going to be more dramatic. If you get closer to that 45 degree, the light is going to hit them directly up front and it's going to be a little bit flatter, I would say. Um, but generally speaking, if I'm doing any like real dramatic work, I'm closer to that 90 degree angle. Um, the first step to off camera flash is no off camera flash. And this is actually when you're actually shooting your images with off camera flash. You want to make sure that you understand that before you shoot any images, you want to get your ambient light corrected before you introduce off camera flash. So when you do that, you need to understand that the shutter speed, your shutter speed controls your ambient light. So the higher your shutter speed, the darker your background and ambient light are going to be. So if I'm taking a portrait of a bride, I want to make sure that I get my settings in before I introduce off camera flash. So um, the flash is what's going to be exposing my subject. So anything in the ambient is going to be done with my camera settings. So it could be with my shutter speed, my aperture. Generally speaking, the way that I think about a, a portrait of somebody um, is my f-stop is going to determine what my depth of field is going to look like. I generally like shooting wide open or close to wide open. Um, and then my shutter speed is going to determine what the background is going to look like. Um, and then my ISO is generally like if I want to compensate a little bit, I'll bring it up and down depending on what, what the initial image looks like. Um, so now that we, we understand that your shutter speed controls your ambient, in order to create that cinematic look, you want to underexpose your ambient light by about one to two stops for that cinematic look. So sometimes I go three stops because I really want to darken out that, that ambient light. Um, and then once I have that really dark ambient light, I introduce my flash at 130 second power at 45 degrees, and I just blast my subject with the flash. And then that's how I usually expose for them. And then the background is underexposed by two to three stops. So um, if I do need to really darken out that ambient light, I need to be in high speed sync. So that's the ability to con to go over your sync speed that your camera allows. So if you turn on, if you have a flash on your camera, or you're shooting off camera flash, it might be limited to about 250th of a second or 200th of a second. And with that, that what high speed sync does, it overrides that and it allows you to go all the way up to 8,000th of a second. So a lot of my work is actually. Uh, done through through high speed sync, so I'm shooting at a really high shutter speed in order to really get rid of the ambient light. Especially being a wedding photographer that might walk into a, a hotel room that might not be the nicest hotel room. Uh, maybe I want to take a photo of the shoes or the rings or a bride, and in order for me to really get rid of that nasty background or maybe like really gross uh, that like overhead lighting that just super yellow lighting, I do that through my shutter speed. So I'm really bringing up my shutter speed. So I can cancel all that stuff out. And then the light is going to be the only thing that's going to be prominent in the image. So, so this is a pretty good example of that. Um, this is a room where I walked in. And I said, well, this room isn't the most, the nicest room in the world. Um, so I'm going to take this, uh, this mirror off the wall. I'm going to put it on this table and I'm going to put the shoes here. Um, and then if you look at the image on the right, that's actually exactly where I shot that. Uh, the big difference here is that I'm bringing up my shutter speed until the ambient light is not present into the image. So um, I'm in, in the thousands as far as my shutter speed goes. Um, and then I just take it to a quick test shot to make sure that I actually deleted all the ambient light through my shutter speed. And then I bring my, um, my softbox in and I had it directly above the shoes at 1 1 28 flash power. Um, since I'm so close to my, uh, my shoes, uh, I don't really require to be at 1 32nd. Usually with portraits, it's 1 32nd. 
Uh, but if I'm that close to the shoes, then I generally won't be um, won't need that that high of a shutter or that high of a flash power. So, uh, and then 35 millimeter lenses are the ones that I usually use for for detail shots like this. So, um, and then obviously shooting details in this way is 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 great. Um, but to me, it's important to really touch on the fact that that detail shots are entirely more important when they incorporate the human element. Um, you can do as many fancy shoe shots and ring shots as you can. Uh, but I always talk about the fact that I've never had a bride make her profile cover photo, uh, her profile or cover photo, a photo of her shoes or a photo of her, her rings. Um, but to me, incorporating the human element really brings in this aspect of, well, now she's looking at the image or the, the groom is looking at the image and they're looking at these images as something that can, they can relate to, something that brings them back to maybe a conversation they were having. So uh, this is a pretty good example of that where I put the, uh, the dress up and everybody kind of started to walk away because they thought I was going to take a photo of the dress. And I just said, hey, no, 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 you just go back and keep doing what you're doing. And I stepped back, I incorporated the human element into it and I got a shot that was entirely more meaningful than than just a regular shot of the, of the dresses. We all love to do the, the dress shots. We all love to do the shoe shots. Um, but in reality, to me, I just think it just looks so much better when you can kind of have that human element to it. So uh, same thing with, with this image. The bride's walking down with the shoes. Um, instead of just kind of taking a photo of the shoes, why not just incorporate uh, the shoes with the bride where, where it just, again, it just plays more of a meaningful part into the story of the day. Sorry for the swear here, but COVID, this was a, a, a COVID wedding and, and she was finally ready to get married. And that's where I, where she, uh, she, I told her to come in and, uh, and grab the, her mug and I put the ring next to it. So, and again, just a simple shot of, um, of, uh, of her holding her, her sandals and just a, a nice dress shot with, with the shoes in it. So, all right. So let's talk about portraits and shooting them with off camera flash. Uh, there's a couple of different things that I do. There's a two shot technique, which is something like this. And then I have my assistant uh, light them with, uh, with softbox. And then I just Photoshop them out. Um, there's also silhouettes. Um, so what I'm doing here is I am using a softbox directly behind the subject. So if you look at the background here, that's actually my softbox and I'm incorporating that as my ambient light. So, um, for example, this image is also done with that. Um, I shot it with a, a Fuji GFX 50S and a 65 millimeter lens. Again, I'm shooting at high speed sync, so I'm at one four thousandth of a second because it's that's going to allow me to shoot at f 1.4. So it allows me to shoot wide open. Um, and if I put those softbox behind them, it's going to act as the ambient light and it just creates a really nice silhouette of of the couple. It's a very simple technique, especially if you're in in uh, a room or a venue that's not super aesthetically pleasing, um, you can always create some really nice images uh, with this technique. And again, since the softbox is so close to the, the subject, I'm at 164th power. So, and that's sort of what, what that looks like. And you can kind of move around and get a couple of different angles and it just creates a, a really, really cool look and, and couples absolutely love, love the way that these come out, so. Uh, I like to do a ton of Brenizer stuff, especially with off-camera flash. Um, if anybody's not familiar with the Brenizer, it's essentially just a portrait. It's a panorama shot with an 85 millimeter or like a 135, a long focal length, wide open. Um, and and uh, when it's shot wide open, what it is, it's just a wide angle image of shot with a wide with a long focal length and it shows the compression and the depth of field of of the 85 or 135 wide open it could be a 7200 just as long as it's a long focal length wide open it should be good um, you want to shoot it wide open uh, and you want to stitch the images together in light as panorama it's super easy to do all you're doing is essentially taking uh, so for example this image here i took one two three four five six seven eight images um, and then I take up the first image with off camera flash uh, of my subject. I try to fill the frame with them. And then I take, I sort of like go around in a circle. Um, and then in Lightroom, I put them together. And this is the, the final image. So uh, it's a really cool technique. It really works out really well when it comes to, um, to just having this like grand image of maybe a venue or, 
um, just any other sort of background. Um, but again, shooting it at those long focal lengths and having that same compression uh, and the depth of field of the long focal lengths wide open gives it a really cool look. Uh, this is with a 58 millimeter uh, 1.4. I took a bunch of images here, but this is what the final image looked like. So, um, and when you're incorporating off camera flash, you can kind of use the first the first shot with off camera flash, and then have your move your soft or your softbox or modifier or move, have your system move out of the way, and then take the other images and then put them. It's really simple. You just highlight all the images in Lightroom, and then um, and then go into create panorama, and it automatically does it for you. So. Uh, this is with a fractal filter. Um, it's a really cool little, uh, if anybody's not familiar with it, it's just like a, a glass uh, filter that you can shoot through and it creates this very spiral look. Um, again, incorporating off camera flash into it with the same exact techniques. Um, I'm underexposing the, the background uh, to the point where it's just uh, uh, the lights behind them so they actually have like a wall of lights behind them and then what it does is it reflects back onto the filter i shoot through the filter and and it creates a very cool spiral look so uh, i'm at 1.6 i'm again i'm usually pretty close to wide open uh one one thousandth of a second iso 800 uh 130 second flash power which is what i generally will start off as uh for portraits so sorry uh, again, this is a two-shot technique, so I'm just having my assistant hold the light here, just to light the ride here, and I take a second shot without the uh, without my assistant, and then I just composite everything into it. So it's super simple to use. If you're if you're wondering how to how to actually composite the images, I have a video on our YouTube channel at Studio Flint Society, and it's a very simple way to do it. It takes a couple of minutes. Um, just watch the video. It's like a, it's less than like ten minutes to to watch it, and it just shows you how to how to uh, shoot the two two images and how to composite them into each other. So this is with a forty five millimeter. Again, same thing. I'm using two different uh, two different shots. I'm taking my plate shot, which is the one with no softbox in it, and then I'm incorporating the off camera flash into it, and then I just composite them together. So and again, I'm at one thirty second flash power. Uh, and then once you get used to doing these two shot composites, you can kind of get a little bit more creative with um, what you would call a composite. So um, when it comes to composites, I would say that it, they can be a little bit tricky, but once you do the two shot composites, you'll get a little bit more used to it. Um, and to me, composites are sort of that wow shot. Like I've always, I always talk about the the fact that the difference between a good photographer and a great photography is generally like four or five images per wedding. Um, and those are the ones that really stand out images are the, the ones that, that really take a lot of skill to practice. Um, and to me, the composites are really what sort of will set you apart from, um, from the rest of the images. Those are the ones that your couples are going to look at and go, Oh, wow, these are amazing. Um, so for example, this wedding here, uh, we were running super late. And the wedding planner came up to me and says, you have 10 minutes to do uh, wedding party portraits. And I said, well, crap, uh, we don't, that's not enough time. So I went up to the bride and groom and said, hey, uh, what would you rather have? Would you rather just have a bunch of images that we could just take real quick? Or would you rather have this amazing image that I can create in maybe five, six, seven minutes? And of course, they're going to go, all right, well, let's get the amazing image. Um, so this here was taken with uh, just a flash next to next to me and just you know this is an okay image this is well exposed it's probably something that most people would would generally hand in uh but with a composite you can create something like this and this is where the difference is between creating something that is just very okay and it's just going to look fine in the gallery and then you have that wow image this is the image that they're going to print out this is the image that they're going to have as their facebook cover this is the image that they're going to show everybody. This is the image that they're going to put up on their wall. Um, and then those little little things that you can do um, are the ones that are really going to be the differentiating factor between those good photographers and the great photographers um, because there's not much difference. It's really just learning a couple of techniques and just really focusing on, on not only creating a great experience to your couples, but creating those wide images and those signature images. And to me, the signature images are these composites 
Uh, they're the two set composites and they're all done with off, off camera flash. So, uh, this was taken with a 24 millimeter at 1.8, uh, one one thousandth of a second. Again, I'm using one one thousandth of a second because I want to get rid of that background. I don't want all this stuff in it. So what I'm doing is I'm really bringing up that shutter speed so I can really get the dramatic look and I want my subjects to stand out. Um, and that's 164th flash power because it was sort of a darker uh, room. So I started off at 132nd and I said, oh, well, they're a little bit overexposed. So I'm going to bring it down to 164th. Uh, and this was nine images that was composited into, into this finalized image. So uh, this is another example. Uh, this sort of gives you an idea of like how many images I'm taking. So this is a different one, but um, this is nine is nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven images. Um, and then so I just photograph each individual person separately. And then what you do is you just go into Photoshop and you open them as layers. And, and then when you open them as layers, um, you can go in there and just create a layer mask. Uh, you want to align all the uh, layers. Um, and then you just kind of brush everybody into the image. Again, this is something that I it takes a little bit to kind of go through, but it's super important. So if you wanted to look at the actual tutorial on how to do this, I also have a, a video on how to do this that's completely free and it's it's on our Steel and Fun Society uh, YouTube channel. So, and you don't need a tripod. I think the most important thing here is that the Align Layers tool from Photoshop is unbelievable. So you can kind of throw a bunch of images at it and it'll read the images and it'll align them properly. So. Um, you want to make sure that you want to stick to the same direction of light. So make sure that, that you have, you, you go from the same direction every time that you take an image. Sometimes I break that rule, but, but most of the time I try to stick to the same direction. So. And we do have a bunch of questions coming in too. So, uh, just make sure we leave uh, sure. enough time to answer some of these. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the final image of what that looked like. Um, again, uh, it's super simple tool to have. Um, especially if you have uh, enough time to do like a cool, a cool shot. So definitely, definitely look into it and check out the, the video that I have. Uh, family portraits, I usually do just a very simple, just two light setup uh, on each side of, of, of me. And I just usually just use the same light power so that it's nice and even. Um, this particular image was at F2, 1 500th. Again, I kind of want to underexpose that background a little bit and then at a low ISO. Um, and then my light, my lights on each side are at 1 32nd. So uh, cocktail hour again. I don't. I like to talk about cocktail hour because it's one of the most important aspects of weddings. Um, I think we underestimate just the just how much practice we can get from human interactions through cocktail hour. Um, I generally don't use off camera flash during cocktail hour, but if you're watching this and you miss cocktail hour, shame on you. Please change that immediately. Cover cocktail hour because it's the most important part of the day, especially if you're trying to be a photojournalistic. Uh, photographer and you're trying to really capture natural emotions between people go to cocktail hour because that's that's unbelievably important and we overlook it because we're so focused on a lot of the technical aspects and like putting stuff together and setting up lights and all that stuff so uh so the reception uh i'm really proud of my work except for my reception lighting which is literally everybody that has shot any wedding in the history of the world uh if if you shot a wedding reception you've probably been disappointed by it i know that i have uh, so there's a couple of different techniques that I, that I use. So I use my voice uh, activated light stand, which is my Val, uh, my assistant. So I can tell them to go wherever they can go. Uh, and they, I don't have to actually stop doing what I'm doing and move any lights. Um, this is also with my Val. So again, with the 24 millimeter, I like to make sure that I'm close at a wider focal length. It just feels like it gives that better, a little bit of a better look. I don't want to shoot receptions at 50 millimeters or 85. Um, maybe during COVID, it probably was a good idea. But I think that at a wider focal length, super up close and really getting that, that cinematic feel where like you're shooting at a high uh, shutter speed and close to wide open, it gives a really cool look. So uh, this is sort of a diagram here that, that you have. You, again, that 45 degree angle is sort of the starting point. You want to make sure that they have the, uh, the soft box or uh, I use a max here sometimes. I just kind of have them just make sure that they have the, the light pointed in the direction that I'm shooting and your settings will take care of it. So uh, this is actually shooting with more than one light, which I'm kind of breaking my own rule here, but I think it's important to cover this. Um, it's probably the most used technique. Uh, you have two lights in the rear. Make sure you don't use, you don't pull light stands on the dance floor. Such a liability. If you're going to put a, a light stand up, put it in the back of the room, up as high as you can possibly get it, and just sort of point it towards you. 
Um, these lights are only here to just kind of give a little bit of a kick to the image. Uh, where you see them, um, the light that's hitting them, that's from my on-camera flash. Um, a lot of the time I see a lot of chandeliers with a lot of shadows. Um, one way to really get rid of that is to really kick up the power on your on-camera flash. So, I mean, sometimes I'm shooting at, like, for example, on my on-camera here is at one-eighth power. Some people are afraid to go to one-eighth power. Sometimes I'm at a quarter power. Sometimes I'm at a half power. The only thing that you want to make sure that you realize is that when you're at that power, your recycle times are going to be longer. So if I'm firing off a shot at full power or half power, I'm going to have to be conscious of the fact that it's going to take a couple of seconds for the flash to recycle. Uh, but this is all done with just two tiny lights in the back and a non camera flash that's, that's uh, fired into the ceiling. So this is sort of the opposite. Um, I wanted to get everything in focus. I wanted those shadows. So I'm shooting at F16. So if I'm at F16, I'm compensating with my shutter speed. So instead of going up super high on my shutter speed, I'm going to 1 125th. Um, and then my since I am at F16, I'm not really letting a lot of light into my sensor. And I am at a half power in 8600, which is a really powerful light. And my rear is at 132nd power. So it gives a little bit of a different look. If you're at F16, it's kind of the sweet spot to get that like starburst effect on, on the lenses. Uh, and it gives that cool effect on the lights. So. And then the last thing is just dragging the shutter um, at a half second uh, shutter speed at F8. I want to point my flash towards my subjects. That's one of the biggest mistakes that people make when dragging the shutter is that they always want to bounce up. Point that flash right at the subject. If you have a bunch of drunk people, they'll not, they will not know that you're pointing a flash at them. So point it right at them, and you want to be at about 132nd. And you can kind of adjust according to what your first couple of shots look like. But you want to make sure that you're at rear curtain sync. So your flash and camera should have a setting that says rear curtain sync. Because what happens is, if I'm at a half a second, if I push the shutter, it's going to start the exposure for a half a second, and the flash is going to fire at the end. So the flash, just like we talked about earlier, the flash is what's going to be exposing my subject. So when that flash fires, it's going to be making my subject sharp. And then all the lines and all that funky stuff is going to be done through my shutter speed. So again, going back to that, we're going for a full circle here. Going back to the other thing where I said your shutter speed controls your ambient light and the same thing here where I have it open for a half a second, just as it's open for a half a second, it's creating the, those squiggly lines and then my flash at the end of the exposure is what's going to be freezing my subject. So, and then I also have a reel on my Instagram if you have any questions about that. So, and I think that's it. Holy 47 cap. minutes. How do we do? That's a lot of information. That is a ton of information. Uh, and we've got uh, <laughs> some questions coming up now. So uh, cool. we're going to want to go pretty rapid fire on this uh, so yeah. that uh, we can get through as many as we can. Um, so cool. uh, first question we have is from Alicia. Uh, does your client mind that you're both uh, light and airy and moody? Do you need to be one versus no. the other? Absolutely not. Clients don't care about that. If uh, at least uh, I don't want to say clients don't care about that. I think that generally speaking, people don't necessarily notice that. So I want to make sure that I'm I'm attracting clients that are just hiring me for for my work. And if I'm displaying both aspects of my work, um, then they know that that when I go there, depending on the lighting conditions, they're 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 going to get that's what they're going to both, get. or they might only get one. So um, I don't think that you should limit yourself to really only displaying one set of of styles. Um, I'm very open about how I, depending on what light I'm in or what conditions I'm in, I'm going to shoot, uh, just purely based on light and, and the venue and, and the lighting conditions. So cool. Good question. Uh, Jessica wants to know, uh, very quickly, what gear do you need to get started? Oh, I would go with a Geek Auto GT 200, a trigger. And I mean, if, if you, if it's within your budget, get a mag box. Um, if it's not within your budget, there's a couple other brands that you can do with a glow, uh, soft boxes are amazing by Adorama and they're super affordable. Um, so yeah, so just light do a trigger a, and a modifier. Simple stroke. Yeah. Yeah. That's all you need. One light. All right. From Angela. Uh, would love to hear more about switching the strip and the Octa and when to use which one. Uh, so when I'm doing composite, I really want to have full control of, of my light. I'm using the strip. Um, and I'll put the grid on it because I really want that moody look to it. Uh, if I'm most of the time when I'm creating that 90 degree angle to create that really moody light, I'm using the strip. 
Um, and I'm, and the good thing about the strip is that you can kind of put it right as, beside their body. So it lights up their entire uh, upper half, I would say. But with the softbox, it's more of like their faces. So if I'm doing a full body shot, then I'll do the strip and I'll put it like right next to them and I'll create that really cool movie shot. All right. From Kella, uh, question. Um, how big is the difference between the 24-inch Octabox versus a flash with an umbrella modifier? Uh, so there's two completely different things. So a flash is the flash with a an umbrella. An umbrella is actually going to spread light everywhere. So if you want full control of where your light is going, you want a softbox or an octobox. There's two very different looks. If you actually want a more even look, uh, then you want that umbrella. Uh, the the Max here and an umbrella have a similar look where it just kind of once the light comes out, it just kind of goes wherever. You really have no control over it. Um, but with a softbox, you can kind of direct that a little bit better. So there's a pretty drastic difference in the way that the images will look based on what you're using. All right. From Anna, um, how – so always wondered during a wedding day, how do you have enough time to capture so many creative shots? Uh, do couples expect to have a longer portrait time or are they spaced out the entire day? Kind of, How's that work for you? Um, so one of the things that I, I think that when people work with me, they're surprised is that I generally will do these shots in like three, four minutes. If I'm doing a composite, I've been doing it for so long that it really doesn't take me that long anymore. When I first started off, I was very conscious of the fact that maybe I needed to say, hey, listen, this this might take 10 minutes, but it'll be worth it. Um, so the more you do it, obviously, it'll get easier. Um, I mean, I'm doing composites in a couple minutes. I'm doing two shot composites in a few minutes. Um, but I would say just start off with, with making sure that you set the correct expectations with your clients. And as long as, as they're there and they're willing to, uh, to work with you, then do a quick composite, do, even if it takes 10, 15 minutes. But once you do it three or four times, once you get the setup and, and cause the hardest part about doing composites and stuff like that is not the actual shooting, but the planning and the envisioning where you should do it. Um, so once you get really good at that, the process becomes a little bit easier. So just keep doing it. Uh, from Elvin, uh, was the shot with the bride coming down the stairs scripted? The one where she was holding her shoes? Yes. So she came down the stairs and I envisioned the shot. And then the next time she came up, she went up the stairs. I actually went up and I said, Hey, when you come down, can you just throw the shoes over the railing? And then I did that. So that one was scripted. There was no, I, I did envision it when she came down. Um, then I, I waited for the opportunity to come for her to come back up. And I sort of directed her a little bit and she didn't know what I was doing, but I just, I composed the image and I just took a bunch of shots of her coming down the stairs and I chose the best one. Okay. Uh, so from Z, can you walk us through the iconic composite that with the, the Bernizer group photo from the cabin where the group was inside the cabin and you were outside? Oh, oh, um, Is that a so if you was actually, this one? <laughs> no, it wasn't on there. It's funny that they yeah. mentioned that cause that was, uh, that was a shot that I posted a, a while ago. Um, it's the same exact technique as the composites. The only thing is that I was just lighting them from the outside of the cabin. Um, and then I just directed the bride and, and the bridesmaids to sort of look at different direction. But it's all the same technique. I'm just taking multiple shots. I'm not on a tripod. I want to make sure that I just sort of stay within the same area. Um, then I bring it into Photoshop. I align the layers. And I just brush everybody in. If you go on to the Steel and Flint Society YouTube channel, you can... You can see how I did that. It's all the same exact technique. And that's what I, what I was talking about earlier is that if you learn how to do, how to shoot in this way, you can get creative with it and do different, all kinds of different things. But it wasn't, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, from Alex, uh, while you're creating the composites using off-camera flash, do you use a tripod? I shoot like a drunk monkey, so being handheld for a composite <laughs> sounds crazy like me, or to me. <laughs> well, the, it does sound crazy, and it does sound crazy to me. I think there was a few at the beginning that I used the tripod, um, but then I realized that the Align Layers tool in Photoshop, I mean, Photoshop is such an amazing tool. The, the, I mean, for you to be able to give it, I mean, I've done composites of like 15 different images and I just throw them on as layers and I align the layers and 99% of the time it'll read them and it'll align them perfectly. As long as when you're taking the image, you're not doing any like drastic movements or changing your angle or changing focal lengths. Um, it, it just does such an amazing job that I just honestly do not see a need for a tripod at all. All right. Uh, from Anna, if you're shooting a wedding alone, um, how do you make sure you have enough time for a cocktail hour? Do you always do a first look? 
I'm not shooting my wedding alone. I just, I made a very conscious decision that I was not, I was always going to have an assistant with me. Um, even when I'm, when I'm booked as a single shooter, I'll have an assistant with me and they're a capable shooting assistant. So, I mean, I'm not saying that you should cover cocktail hour every single wedding, but if, if you're shooting alone and you have to set stuff up, then obviously that's important. But I would say that figure out a way to, to get to a point where you are enabling yourself to be part of cocktail hour, because I think it's such an important aspect of the day that we just, we just ignore it because we're doing other things. Um, and if you really want to get good at capturing emotion and interactions, like that's where, where everything's at. You can kind of be a fly on the wall and capture all that stuff. Uh, but, but if you're shooting by yourself, I mean, you got to set up flights and you have to set up flights. <laughs> you have to do the work. Um, yeah. 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 So from Kella, uh, with two off camera flashes and, uh, one on camera setup is a similar effect doable with just one on camera flash behind the subject as well. Or is the purpose of the off-camera flash behind the subjects to add backlighting or make it look like a paparazzi or starburst in the back? Yeah, that's, that's essentially the only thing. I mean, if you wanted to do one off-camera flash and then an on-camera flash, and I've done that too, where it's just kind of the one behind and then the one up front. Uh, it gives off this sort of the same look. Um, I think most, most people like to use a two in the back because they kind of want that balance, that symmetry between the lights. So. Uh, from Chantel, when you have a voice activated light stand, are you triggering with a trigger on the camera flash or on camera flash? Yes. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, always triggering with off camera flash. So I have a trigger on camera and then I have my assistant holding the light. Uh, so I'm, that's the only light that I'm basically triggering. So. Okay. And last question before we get some prizes and stuff. Uh, what gel would you recommend for an all day wedding? Uh, have you found it distracting for your clients? Uh, gel. So I always talk about gels because I. I highly recommend using a gel, but I never use them because I always forget to use them. Um, but, uh, I mean, the easiest one to use would probably be a half CTO. Um, if you, especially since it, it mostly depends on like what type of venue you're shooting in. If you're in like this barn that looks completely yellow and you're really trying to match the lights and you have like these really yellow lights and maybe a full CTO, but generally like a half CTO, I found that that is a pretty good way to kind of get you, close to, to what the ambient light is going to look like okay and was that and any difference if that's going to be hair gel that we're talking about oh gel <laughs> is it, are they talking about hair gel? <laughs> i'm not sure i'm watching the comments and uh chantel's either being uh quite witty or uh uh that was another question i'm not sure yeah so uh american crew uh <laughs> hair pomade it's a low shine low hold because you always, when you're talking to people at one end, you always want to run your fingers through your hair. And that is where they want to book you when you run your fingers through right. your hair. It's that so obvious, it makes sexy a huge sort of vibe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Awesome. Well, let's give away uh, uh, surprises and stuff because uh, that's yeah. always kind of fun to do. Uh, so this is coming at us from American Color Imaging. They do have a special going on now for everybody that's watching. You can get 25% off of big prints. Uh, the code's up on the screen and that's good until September 5th. So make sure you jot down that code. Um, I'll also be emailing this out as well so you don't have to uh, write it down. Uh, but let's give away some stuff. Up first, we've got a $50 lab credit to ACI, and let's see who that winner is. Got the official wheel. Yes, a lot of people registered for this one, so it's hard to read. Luckily, uh, the wheel of names will uh, bring it up big. So we'll see our winner of the $50 is Lisa. So uh, make sure to watch your email for that one. So congrats, Lisa. And uh, let's get to our next yes. prize. This one's going to be a $75 lab credit. Uh, so let's see the winner on our $75 lab credit. Coming up with the wheel again. And that one's Mary. Congrats, I'm Mary, high. on that one. And now we've got our final prize, a $100 lab credit. Uh, so let's check out that winner. I love giving away prizes. It's always fun. Same. Everybody likes free stuff. And this is Melissa. And Melissa, there wasn't a last name, so if you have K78 somewhere in your email address, uh, that's you. 
All right. So uh, cool. we've got our winners there. And uh, do want to uh, kind of go, where's my slide? Here we are. Uh, and let you know that uh, we do have episodes that uh, do come up every two weeks. Um, and our next ones, we've got storytelling with Dana Rose. So finding your perspective with Photoshop, real estate photography with Colby Mecklemore. And we have B, finding your path, a little bit more inspirational one with Renee Gage. So those are upcoming programs, registrations open for those ones. And if you do have ideas for future shows, topics, people that you'd like to see, uh, make sure to email me. That's hello at cwoolly.com. Uh, that's how we come up with our different speakers and subjects. Uh, so make sure that uh, we're looking into that. All right. Uh, we're officially at time. So any parting words uh, for us or like, how can we get a hold of you, learn more, get more Esteban time, more hair care tips, anything like that? <laughs> well, my phone number is actually, two, I'm just kidding. I'm not <laughs> going to give everybody my phone number. Um, if obviously the, the, the easiest way, if you have any questions about anything, it's the reason why I started Steel and Flint. Um, I always talk about that at the beginning of my career. I, I felt like I didn't really have any resources or anybody that was helping me get through the what I think is the toughest part of, of, of this industry. And it's just pushing through the beginning of, of my career. Um, so if you, anybody has any questions about anything, just join Steel and Flint Society on Facebook and ask. Um, it, honestly, there's, there's a bunch of us in there and we're so supportive of each other. Um, if you have any specific questions about anything, feel free to shoot me a DM. I, I might get a little, take a little bit longer to, to respond, but, but again, I think the benefit of the group is that everyone kind of gets to learn from it. Um, and then if you're interested in attending one of my workshops, um, I have a, a few that are going to be announced. I have Charleston, uh, South Carolina. I have, um, uh, New York city, uh, at the beginning of next year, which I'll announce in the group in a couple of weeks. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's basically the, the best way to get, to get in touch with me, just the group. Cool. So uh, I am going to send out in the follow-up email, all the links so that uh, you can just click the button and join his group, um, get access to it as well as his, as his website, uh, just in case you don't have a pen handy. But uh, thank you so very much. I appreciate you joining us from your hotel room. I know you're a busy man and traveling and sharing information and uh, the joys of photography. So uh, thank you again so much, Esteban. Oh, thank you for having me. Honestly, it was a blast. And I'm, hopefully it won't be the last time that, that our paths will cross. I'm sure, I'm sure I'll see you uh, at some conference. You've given me some tips on, on how to properly judge images. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, have a great night, everybody. And thanks for joining. Thank you, everyone.